This video is going to be about the visual elements and principles of design as based on Preble's Art Forms by Patrick Frank. So we're going to get started with line. That seems really simple, but there's actually a lot to lines. As I've written here, lines can be emotive, they can be active, they can be static, they can be aggressive, passive. For example, if you drew lines with a ruler, they would look really clean and professional. But if you hand drew them or you were even making a doodle, it would feel more personal, intimate, and expressive. Lines can function in a similar way to language. You can be depicting the same subject or talking about the same story, but the way that you use the words or the kinds of lines that you use, the composition that you use, they all can tell a different story even though you're talking about the same thing. In the example I have here by artist Vince Lowe, there's a lot of energy in the lines to reflect that one, this is a music video, but two, there's a lot of energy in what's happening in the music video. There's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of emotions, so all of that's kind of reflected in the lines that he chooses to use to represent that. Uh, continuing talking about lines, there's also implied lines. Lines that don't really exist. They're not drawn into the plane, but they're kind of suggested by the forms in the plane, or maybe by the direction that a character is looking. So in this example, you can see the painting, the shapes of the bodies form triangles, but also the dog on the, in the bottom left, it's looking back up at the human, which is creating an implied line or a sight line. We also see this with the figures in the background. They're looking up and down at each other, which is creating those implied lines. And implied lines really just tell us how our eyes moving around the picture. So we kind of follow the sight line of where our subjects are looking. We want to know what are they looking at. Another example of a line that is implied and not explicitly drawn is in the bottom photo, where you have these lines that kind of stop at this invisible barrier and they give the suggestion of a line without there actually being a line. Lines can connect to create shapes or to create the illusion of a volume or a form. Our top example, it only has the boundaries, the edges of the form. There's no shading, there's no coloring or anything. And so that's called a contour line drawing. It's just the absolute edges. The bottom image also uses straight lines to create a sense of space and depth. However, the second image relies more on the illusion of lighting, whereas the first one doesn't really have lighting at all. As I mentioned, hatching is where you keep drawing lines and stacking them on top of each other to create a shadow, but you can also stack them in opposite directions, like we see in the background behind the table on the Alice in Wonderland illustration. The lines are going in all kinds of different directions because it helps you to get a darker value. If they're all going the same direction, at some point you're going to kind of fill it in to be totally black, but if you keep changing the direction, it's going to stack on top while showing all of the lines. Some drawings use only hatching, they don't cross hatch at all, and that's totally fine. It's just another tool to help you get variation in the different shadows. Earlier I mentioned contouring as a way to designate edges, but there's also cross contouring, which is kind of like hatching and cross hatching, where you, like in the dollar bill example, you're hatching in a way that's not just straight lines, you're kind of curving to the, the curvature of whatever you're drawing, like the, around the nose or below the eyes of your subject. And this can give a more naturalistic and realistic look, as you can see with the, the dollar bill example. But it's also just a stylistic choice, because the Alice in Wonderland illustration isn't trying to be realistic. It's supposed to be an illustration. Earlier I mentioned that lines can have energy. Well, in doing this, they can also show motion. And both of these artists have done this. They've overlaid the same subject in different positions as they move through time to give the illusion of motion. We all know that these images aren't moving. But in drawing them this way, the artist is giving us the suggestion or the implication of motion. By transposing what is basically different frames of a video into one image, we also get a sense of time. For instance, look at the dog's legs and the tail versus how the leash is moving. There's a different number of frames, so we get a different sense of time. Time also can move in a sequence, almost like a comic book, with or without frames. Like in this example, the meeting of St. Anthony and St. Paul. We're watching the same figure as they move through space. And we're also going to want to read an image in a very similar way that we would read text on a page. We're going to want to read top down and depending on your region and like what languages you read left to right or right to left. And this helps to sequence the events that we're seeing in the image. And it goes on to create a narrative using solely visual cues. So we saw that figure moving through space to give us a sense of time but it also gave us a sense of space. So if we look through these examples overlap, we saw the trees overlapping one behind the other one, and that, that told us which was in front of which. 
We looked as they diminished in size. So if something is smaller, it's obviously farther away from you. Vertical placement is based on where we're looking. So the closer something is to the horizon, it's probably farther away because the closer something is to us, it's gonna be closer to our feet. They're standing on the same ground as us. So they're gonna be lower in the pictorial plane. And the previous image kind of used all of these. Um, as he started his journey, he was farther back in the scene. He was smaller, he was higher, and this helped to give us a sense of spatial depth. Another example of how to create space is atmospheric perspective. And you'll notice this when you look at mountains. And the ones closest to you, you can see the trees, and then further back, you maybe can't see the trees and it's a little bit lighter, but the ones really far away, they're in even lighter color. So as the environment is between you and whatever you're seeing, you're going to see less of it and it's going to be lighter because it's a little distorted from all of the, the atmosphere between you and the object. And this is called atmospheric perspective. So this example is really great. In the foreground, you have all of the foliage, the trees, the details. And then as you move backwards, like on the left, we see the darker mountain. And then on the right, in the very far back, we see a lighter mountain. And these are just ink washes. They don't have any detail. And in doing this, the artist is mimicking how we experience reality while also embracing what he can do with the different techniques of the ink. So as we will learn throughout art history, some artists get famous for making rules and creating things that work, and some artists get famous for breaking these rules. And someone who is very famous for that is M.C. Escher. So in this example, he is using what's called figure ground ambiguity. So the figure is going to be the subject, whatever is in the foreground, what we're looking at, like what's being painted. Um, and then the ground is going to be what's behind it that pushes the figure forward. So in this example, in the top half, the bird is the figure and the white is the ground. But in the bottom half, the fish is the figure and the black is the ground. So when you get to this middle area, it gets kind of confusing, like what is the figure, what is the ground? And that's what he's playing off of. That's the figure ground ambiguity that makes this interesting. So in the middle where you're wondering which one is which, that's the whole point. There is no clear answer. They are both neither. Another way of establishing depth and space in the pictorial plane is using perspective. This basically means you're creating the illusion of three-dimensional space as things recede backwards on the two-dimensional plane. So the vantage point is where the viewer is in relation to the scene that we're looking at. The horizon line is where the sky meets the land, and it's usually at about the viewer's eye line. The vanishing points are where everything in space recedes back and seems to converge into a singular point. So there's, there's more than three kinds, but we're only going to address three. Once it gets past three, it gets kind of complicated. One point perspective, everything converges to one point. A good example is looking down railroad tracks, looking down a street, down a hallway, even looking at a room from the center of one wall. Two-point perspective, you're just going to be receding to two points. So usually this is where you're looking at a street corner, and one street converges to one vanishing point, and one street converges to the other vanishing point. Three-point perspective is just like two-point, with the added vantage point of up or down. So for instance, if you were looking up at a very tall skyscraper, it would seem to converge up at the top. Or if you were looking down the same skyscraper, the building's gonna taper smaller as you look downward. This is an example of simple one point perspective. So here the vanishing point is about at my eye line, because I took this photo, and the perspective lines all go to that vanishing point. You can see the windows line up, the roofs line up, the sidewalk lines up, it's all converging as it recedes back into space. Now these yellow lines show things that are parallel. So the verticals are going to be parallel to each other because we're not looking at them from up or down. We're looking at them pretty straight on. And the horizon line is going to be parallel to all of your horizontal lines. And we can see this in the bottoms of the cars, where the building on the right stops. We can see it in the street and in the rooftop. This is our example photo for two-point perspective. Here we see there are two different vanishing points, one on the left, one on the right. And a good way to know if you're looking at two-point perspective is to find a corner, whether it's external coming outward at us like this one, or internal going inward like the corner of a room. So here with two-point perspective, because one of our horizontal lines is going to another vanishing point, 
it's not in the center like in one point. We only have one set of parallel lines, and these are our verticals, because again, we're assuming we're looking at it right at eye level, and those are all going to be parallel. For three-point perspective, I used the same porch. I just looked at it from a downward angle. Again, we have our left and right that we had in two-point, but we have a third point. So in this example, I'm looking from the bottom up, but it could just as well be from the top down. And this is another vanishing point. As you can see, the porch starts to converge upwards. And you can see there are no parallel lines because they're all going to different vanishing points. Here we can see the comparison between the parallel lines and the different vanishing points in one, two, and three point perspective. So again, we have another artist who's breaking the rules. So instead of looking at this still life, this arrangement of objects from one place and just painting them totally in perspective, Cezanne sought out to not give us the illusion of a space but the experience of being in the space with these objects. We can see them from different angles. The shadows are different, the table edges are different. It gives the viewer more of an experience of time and space with the objects rather than just doing what a photograph could do and recreating it. Moving on to color, we have primary colors. These cannot be made by mixing any other colors together. They're quote pure colors. We have red, yellow, and blue. Now when you mix these together, you create secondary colors, purple, green, and orange. And mixing a primary and a secondary together will give you tertiary colors. And you can see below, red and purple will just be red and purple. We wouldn't call this maroon because it's not the exact color of maroon. Colors have really fancy names for really specific colors, but this is just 50-50 red and purple mixed together. They're exact in between. It may sound oversimplified, but it's exactly what we're wanting to say. So each of these colors have their own variations outside of being mixed with each other. Color is usually just a general term, but hue is what we mentioned earlier. Those are the, the pure colors from the color wheel with no additive, whether it be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Now, a tint is when you add white to a hue. And this can range anywhere from the hue to right before the color white. A tone is when you add a hue with a neutral gray and a shade is when you add a hue with black, anywhere from the hue up to black. I also list value. Value is a measuring of light and dark. So for instance, you could be drawing a green object, but really the shadow is not just dark green, there's hints of blue in it. The value is still darker, but it's gonna be a different color. Here we see a comparison of primary and secondary colors with their hue, a possible tint, possible tone, and a possible shade. So different colors have different relationships to each other. For instance, if you were only going to paint with blues and use the, the hue blue, the tint, the tone, and the shade, that would be monochromatic. You're staying within the same hue, but you're using different versions of it. Complementary colors go really well together. They complement each other. But also, they neutralize each other. A great real-world example of this is when people bleach their hair and it's too yellow so they add purple shampoo to their hair to neutralize the yellow and give a more natural color. Analogous colors are colors that touch on the color wheel. So for instance, you could do blue, green, and yellow as your color scheme instead of just blue or blue and orange. Usually with three colors like this, there's a dominant color, a supporting color, and a third color that accents both of them. So in this example, which is Turner's The Slave Ship, there are reds, oranges, and yellows, which are an example of analogous colors. But if we look throughout on the left side in the sky and in the top right hand corner, we see blue, which is complementing orange, which is probably the most predominant color in the painting. So we were talking about color and color relationships and what, what looks good, what we like, what's pleasing to the eye. So what conceptual purpose would Turner have for making a horrific scene initially look pleasing until you get closer? Something as simple as color choice and the way the colors work can draw us in. And it can function as a metaphor for the way that we consume media. We can look at something and just accept what we've been told, like this is a pretty storm. Or we can look closer and see what's really happening. People, slaves, are being thrown overboard for insurance money. And Turner is using this piece to address all of the people that looked away during this time. The people that just looked and saw a pretty storm without seeing the actual people that were being hurt or the, the actual scene that's happening. They just took it at face value and didn't really want to help people. They didn't check out of their own privilege and help people. 
Next we have texture, which is a tactile surface or the visual representation of those perceived tactile surfaces. So for a much lighter shift in tone, we have breakfast in fur, which is just fur that's been adhered to a saucer and spoon. Then we have the visual representation of texture in Van Gogh's Starry Night. The sky is very textured, the tree is textured, everything is textured as we see with Van Gogh's style. So we've been talking about the different visual elements and now we're moving on to the principles of design. So design is a broad term for anything visual, but composition usually refers to a two-dimensional pictorial plane and the arrangement of the elements within that. So while there are so many things we could talk about, we're going to focus on balance and symmetry, what it means to create emphasis and a rhythm. So balance and symmetry are not synonymous. A picture can be balanced without being symmetrical. Balance just refers to visual stability and even weighting throughout an image. So for example, in Damien Hirst's piece with the butterfly wings, everything is symmetrical, so it's very balanced. It is exactly weighted the exact same. However, in the wave off of Kanagawa, there's still a sense of balance. There's so much action and energy and motion and splashes on the left side, but it balances out with the negative space on the right side. So while symmetry can give you kind of an exact weighted balance because the sides are identical, asymmetrical pieces can do the same thing, but by balancing each other out. Where one side is heavy, the other one accounts for that. Another way that balance and symmetry come into play is with the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds is basically where you separate the horizontal and the vertical aspects of a singular image into three parts. It's more visually pleasing and more naturalistic when we see things at these intersections. So a lot of times artists will really utilize this compositionally by putting interesting aspects on these different intersections. So like here we have a worker on the bottom left intersection and we have a crashed plane on the top right. Compositionally they complement each other and they also create points of emphasis and contrast while still balancing each other out and remaining asymmetrical. Other ways of creating emphasis are through implied and sight lines. Like we mentioned earlier, we're going to follow the gaze of different subjects. So if every angel and saint in the bottom image is looking at the virgin and child, that's where we're going to look. Compositional and perspectival lines point to the main person. So in, again, in the bottom example, the horizontal lines of the background architecture is pointing directly at Mary's head. She's also framed by the throne and the background architecture. She's framed by the people around her. The composition puts her in the exact center. So she's definitely emphasized and totally framed by the composition. Now this 8th century Mayan relief sculpture shows hierarchy of scale. So the largest subject is the most important, and they're usually the highest in the composition. The ruler depicted here is larger than all of the other subjects, and his head is about as high as it can get while still being in the frame. Another way of creating emphasis is to put high points of contrast. So we discussed value earlier, which is basically the degrees of shadow and light. So we're going to be drawn to dramatic lighting where there's really bright colors and really dark colors. We see this example in the bottom photo especially because Mary's robe is very dark and it's the highest contrast against everything else in the image. Next we're going to talk about rhythm. So rhythm is basically just repetition, both uniform and variety, giving the work a sense of visual tempo. So for a uniform rhythm, we see in the top photo that there's a lot of vertical lines. And they're repeating in different shapes. We see them in the architecture of the Speed Museum in the background, and also in the bus stop architecture. We see it in the light poles, in the bus itself. It seems to have a constant, calm rhythm. Whereas in the bottom photo, Everything is very sporadic. There is so much repetition, but there's so much variation as well. Kandinsky made his composition series with the intention of them functioning visually in the same way that music does audibly. So different pieces will rely on this uniformity or this variety to create their rhythm. For instance, Kusama's infinity rooms rely on unity to sell the illusion, whereas Lawrence's work is relying on the creation of a unified rhythm with the seats but also the breaking of that rhythm. By using people that are in dynamic poses, they're creating their own cadence that exists outside of the uniformity. It creates a piece that's more interesting, but also more representative of reality. 
whereas Kusama is creating a place that does not exist in reality and seems alien in its uniformity and its expansion into the infinite. To sum up what we've learned, I wanted to use this example. I saw the number five in gold. The lines are all very straight, so it gives a sense of professionalism or like it's been done by a computer and perhaps not by hand. Yet it's been painted oil on cardboard, so there's an interesting play between those aspects. Looking at the color, we have the analogous color scheme with the orange, red, and very light yellows. And these are contrasted with the complementary blues and purples in the background. In addition, we have literal contrast of dark colors in the background and very bright, light colors in the foreground. There seems to be an emphasis on this center five because it's the lightest color. We have the highest contrast here. And it also correlates to the color in the no for number. So it looks like that's what we're supposed to read, number five. And perhaps it's oscillating forwards and backwards from this central number five. We also see the repetition of the background lines in the different angles. We see the fives echoing forward and backward, almost like they're in motion, but also giving a sense of rhythm. And as they're in motion, they seem to give a sense of space and like they're receding back into one point perspective. So that gives a sense of motion rhythm, but there's also visual rhythm, which we can see in the comparison of the circles and in the circular part of the five. Those kind of echo the same shapes in addition to the little flourish on the end of the five. We could also look at the balance. While this is not symmetrical, the weight is very symmetrical. The NO on the left side, it balances out with the thickness of the 5 on the right side. The top and bottom seem fairly evenly weighted as well. Looking at the lettering in red at the top as offset by the lettering in red at the bottom. There's only one set of text at the top, and yet there's two at the bottom. So while the top text is larger, the bottom text is smaller, but more letters. So again, it's asymmetrical, but it serves to balance each other out and create stability in the piece. And while there are so many other things that we could point out, those are a few high points that I wanted to address looking at everything that we have discussed today. So I wanna leave you with some things to think about at the end of every lecture. So today we talked about visual elements and principles of design. What does that matter? So what? Well, first of all, design is all around us and it's influencing us all of the time. You could take the same subject matter and you could draw it with energetic lines, with strict lines, with sporadic lines, all telling a different story. You can utilize color to entice a viewer to come closer and look at it because they like it. Or maybe the color is culturally coded, like political colors during 2020. Or maybe the color and tone of a photo becomes important when magazines lighten people's skin tone. Likewise, what happens when you only include one woman in your composition and she's on the side? All of these elements are really important because they're not just how to make a painting, how to make a drawing, how to take a photo. It's about how we visually tell stories as a society. Who we depict and how matters. And then you have the extreme examples of propaganda and sometimes functions in ways that we're not really realizing until we learn about these things. So as you take the time to respond to this lecture, like what you learned, what you liked, what you didn't like, what was unexpected, all of that, I want you to also think about the so what. Why does this matter? Why am I telling you? How does it relate to your life? And that is the conclusion of this lecture. Um, be sure you guys stay safe, wear your masks, six feet apart, get enough sleep. I know you won't, but from a student to a student, Make sure you keep yourself a priority throughout this semester, especially during everything that's going on. And that's all I have for today. So I will see you guys in class, and I hope you have a great day.